Welcome to Eco Ask Why, a podcast that dives into industrial manufacturing topics and spotlights the heroes that keep America running. I'm your host, Chris Granger, and on this podcast, we do not cover the latest features and benefits on products that come to market. Instead, we focus on advice and insight from the top minds of industry because people and ideas will be how America remains number one in manufacturing in the world. Welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today, I'm going to talk about a blog article that I read, and the article was called Demystifying Industrial Wi-Fi, and it was such a good article and, and topic, and I thought that our listeners would love to dig into it. I asked the author to join us. He agreed. So with us today, we have Scott McNeil from Global Process Automation. He is their senior network and security engineer, and I'm really looking forward to Scott walking us through this topic. So Scott, how you doing, man? I'm not too bad. How about you? How about you? Oh man, doing lovely, doing lovely. You know, it's it's a beautiful day in North Carolina, so we're just. Uh, hey, if I were any better, I couldn't stand myself. That's right. That's right, man. So, man, that was a great article you wrote. Definitely put a lot of thought into it. So, just first of all, hats off to you, man. And there was a lot of information in that article, and I know you've got a lot to unpack for our listeners. So, start off with a basic foundation, man. What does it mean when we hear that term, industrial Wi-Fi? It may confuse some people, so narrow it down for us. Well, you know, there, there's a lot of information out, out there about Wi-Fi in general, um, but there's not a ton of general information about uh, industrial Wi-Fi. Uh, there's some vendor-specific information. There's information about specific vendor products, but there's really no general support and community involvement out there for industrial Wi-Fi like there is for enterprise, higher ed, and medical. So I, I'm really trying to change that through my blog and through through hanging out and talking with you guys and you know, so the term really refers to both uh, Wi-Fi and the uh, other communication types and protocols that are used in industry and, and in manufacturing, you know, from paper mills to vehicle assembly to canning and bottling, both process and discrete. There, there's a lot of different wireless technologies involved, and the, the term industrial Wi-Fi kind of covers all of that. Okay, very good, man. So... Basically, it's just an industrial environment and, and, the, and the equipment and things like that they are associated with getting that, that service up and running. Okay. So we hear, I read, I'm not we hear, I actually read this. <laughs> and, well, first of all, major points, because I love it when anybody reads anything I wrote, because that means my English isn't terrible. It's not terrible, man. It's not terrible. Uh, you know, a few minor things. My wife, she does a blog too, so I do some edits for her. But, you know, I'll offer that up to you, but it's kind of over my head. So I'm just going to say your your stuff is right on, man. So just <laughs> just keep doing it, bro. <laughs> so you had something in there about packet loss rate. I'm not uh-huh. really sure what that is. Can maybe, can you walk us through that? Okay. Well, first you need to understand the, the two basic packet types, and that's uh, UDP and TCP. Okay. Uh, a UDP a UDP packet is is not guaranteed communication. It's just kicked out. Okay, it's fire and forget. the The device sending it doesn't care if it makes it or not. It just sends all its communication out. If it makes it, great. If it doesn't, well, then too bad. So Scott, can you to to start us off? Can you explain what those two acronyms stand for? Uh, sure. Uh, UDP is the user data bra- datagram protocol, and it's it's connectionist connectionless and like i was saying it's a fire and forget you know it's a it's a fat very fast form of data communication but the sender doesn't care if all the packets make it or not okay so like i said it's, it's fire and forget um now tcp which is transmission control po- protocol tcp is guaranteed communication um and this is where uh packet loss um can really affect things most wireless communication uses tcp um, especially in industrial environment, because we have to guarantee that we are getting data from um, point A to point B. All right. So if uh, when the data is sent in these packets, it's sent with, with specific checksums and whatnot. Uh, so that when the data gets there, if the checksums don't match, that means, hey, I'm missing part of this data. It's going to send back to the, uh, the transmitting body. Hey, I'm missing some stuff. Can you resend that for me? And the other guy is going to say, oh, hey, you know what? You're right. Your checksums don't match. Let's retransmit. All right. So when you have a lot of interference or when you have something that's not configured properly and you start getting a lot of packet loss, that means you're getting a lot of data retransmits. So 
that end device is having to work twice as hard to get the information that it needs, which can affect what the sensor's feedback is. Uh, it can affect what any information you're trying to pull from that end device. So packet loss is, is something that you need to make sure you're keeping under control and keeping to a minimum. So is it kind of like when you say in guarantee, is that kind of like the handshake? Okay, you sent me this. I acknowledge that I got it. Now I can use this data to do whatever I needed to do with it. Correct. Got it. You just made it. You explained it to a fifth grader because I got it, man. <laughs> it was beautiful. Everybody could, could see the light bulbs going off. So anyway, you also talk about latency. Can you kind of walk us through what you're talking um, about there? Latency is, is delay in transmission. So it, it's how long it, does it take for information from point A to get to point B, all right? And you want that latency to be as, as little as possible. Packet loss can have an effect on latency. Interference can have an, an effect on latency. But, you know, your wireless configuration will have a great deal to do with your latency, especially if you're only using single channel, if you're not using channel bonding and getting a higher throughput value. So latency is especially important when you're trying to use industrial wireless protocols, uh, such as wireless Profinet, just as, as an example. Your uh, latency values, if I am correct, because I'm not a pro on Profinet, but your latency values need to be less than... 15 to 20 milliseconds, if I'm correct. And if your deployment can match or beat that, then you shouldn't have a problem using those specific wireless protocols. Cool. Very good, man. So, Scott, we hear this a lot of times, too, about throughput. So how can industrial users improve that? Well, you know, to be honest with you, if you want to improve throughput wireless-wise in an industrial facility, you really need to spend the time and the the capital to have a full wireless assessment done. You need to have a passive survey to identify what's already there and, and what's it, what it's affecting. And you need to have a fair amount of spectrum analysis done because you've got to be able to try and find and pinpoint any sources of non-Wi-Fi based interference. And then once you've gotten all that done, you really need to try to mitigate as much of that interference as possible that, that you found either from non-Wi-Fi based or from other sources throughout the facility. Vendors love to, to come in and when they install their particular system, it's, it's fairly common for them to just install their own little Wi-Fi access point so that their engineers have uh, remote access to their systems, which is really a big breach in security protocol because essentially what they've just introduced is a rogue access point into the network. And so you have to be careful about that. But that's also additional interference you know, it's additional airtime usage, it's additional channel usage that your team just doesn't know about that you need to identify. So if you're not going to get rid of it, if you are going to keep it, you have to be able to work around it. So there's a lot of different factors that really come into play when it comes to try to improve wireless throughput in an industrial environment. Okay. I also hear the terms, man, a lot of times in the industrial floor, talking with, with people that are working with industrial Wi-Fi, that interruption threshold. I don't have a clue what they're talking about. Can you can you walk us through that? Well, by definition, the interruption threshold, it refers to roaming. The ability for your end device to transfer flawlessly and seamlessly from access point to access point as you move around your facility. This is more of a back-end configuration issue, and it just takes some awareness of knowing what kinds of devices are going to be on your network and what their tolerances are so that you can like I said, on the back end, do the proper adjustments to help refine uh, roaming throughout your facility. Now, this interruption threshold and roaming is not an issue that is just restricted to industrial. That's kind of an issue everywhere. So that this is one of those, those items that are pretty much on equal ground no matter where you are, be it at home with multiple APs or at school or at work in the office building or at a hospital or in a paper mill. Gotcha. Okay. So that's across the board there. So I do know in the past going into plants, working with, with end users, configuring like sensors, for instance, and they want to put that on a Wi-Fi and that, and we had to figure out ranges, you know, how far is this sensor going to be good? So what is the best way to determine proper range when we're trying to configure an industrial Wi-Fi system? Well, again, that's really kind of a subjective question because 
it's going to depend on several different factors. Number one, it's going to depend on the power transmit, receive sensitivity and capabilities of that end device. It's going to depend on uh, what APs you have installed and what their capabilities are. And then all the environmental factors that we've been talking about through this whole process, they also have a say in, in what your overall range is going to be. So there's, there's no really set determined method to figure out uh, what your range is going to be. It's you're going to have to take a look at all these different aspects, and then you're going to have to get out there and do trials. If these are, especially if these are brand new devices that, that have never, uh, that you're not familiar with and you've never used before, you're going to have to get out there and essentially test them because the sales guys are going to tell you whatever they need to tell you to sell it to you. You're the, you're the team that's responsible for implementing it and using it. So uh, you, you've really got to get to know that device. Now, if it's something you're more familiar with, if I'm going in and I'm doing an install and I'm looking at a PepLink device or an Aruba device, or if I'm looking at uh, a Siemens device, because I've worked with them before, I already ha have that, that general base knowledge. But when you're, when you're looking at something new, as with anything, you just, you've got to start uh, testing. I got you, man. So it's not really like a, a site survey. I've heard that term. Is that what you're talking about? Or is this something kind of a different process? No, no, this isn't a, the, the site survey is, is for seeing what's already going on in your facility. And it's for doing spectrum analysis to, to, to determine interference types. Trying to figure out the range of new wireless devices is, is, a, is a different process. Gotcha, man. So what are some real world type of items or, or issues that industrial end users are going to have or could run into when they're trying to implement uh, industrial Wi-Fi? Honestly, uh, and, I, and I preach this constantly, is non-Wi-Fi based interference. Spectrum analysis is so, so important because so many of this, the, the mechanics and the machinery that is out there just generates no RF noise. And a lot of times it's completely unknown. And that is a true real world issue. Uh, at one facility, it was an infrared curing machine that as a byproduct of how it was built, it was just completely destroying from 2.3 all the way up to 2.5. In another facility, it was a, a microwave dryer for um, industrial ceramics. You know, it came out of a, an extruder and then product went into this gigantic microwave dryer. Now, this particular dryer was an older model that was imported from Japan. So it was grandfathered in under FCC rules and didn't have to have any shielding. So uh, in that particular facility, it was just destroying the complete upper half of uh, the 2.4 spectrum, forcing all of the Wi-Fi systems to self-adjust down to the lower channels and then stepping all over themselves. So it's these aren't imagined things. This is this is true to life. This is machinery putting out that that interference. Uh, other small real-world problems are misconfiguration and, and just not knowing the systems and the various other controls that you can implement uh, on your configuration to tweak things and, and make things more user-friendly, to enhance that roaming ability, you know, to help stabilize the TXRX values, you know. So those are probably what I see the most is, is just misconfiguration issues and then, like I said, non-Wi-Fi based interference. Right. And I guess if you're aware of those issues, then you can be proactive and get in front of it, make the necessary changes that you need to address it, to improve reliability and functionality and things Absolutely. like that. There, there is no substitute for owning your airspace. To own your airspace, you have to know what is going on in your airspace, be it other wireless networks uh, or be it um, interference values. You have to own it in order to, to make it work properly. Beautiful, beautiful. Now we call it Eco Ask Why. Love to get to the why. So why would be having a better understanding of the of your industrial Wi-Fi be important as we're moving towards smart manufacturing, man? So how would you answer that? I'm gonna make a. I'm gonna date myself here. Uh, it's like the old saying, "GI Joe, knowing is half the battle," and that could not be a more truer statement for this, because knowing what's going on in your airspace makes it so much easier to start implementing all of these latest and greatest advancements for industrial Wi-Fi. These manufacturers are now actually starting to build into their systems. So the more you learn, the more you know, the better off you are because you can, you can then plan better and implement better and then you're working better. 
Very cool, man. Well, Scott, you have really helped us a lot today. We, we will link your blog post here in our show notes for our listeners so they can go check it out. Demystifying Industrial Wi-Fi, man. You, you really helped to unpack a lot of information. Appreciate your time. It's always fun working with you and the guys at GPA. Uh, great partners with us. So just thank you so much again, buddy. Oh, man, you know what? I, I've thoroughly enjoyed it, and I, and I look forward to our, our next conversation. Absolutely, man. Well, you have a great day. All right, you too. Thank you for listening to Eco Ask Why. This show is supported ad-free by an electrical equipment company. Eco is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit ecosy.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S-W-H-Y dot com.